All right, students, let's begin. Today we have Dante's The Divine Comedy 2019. I believe it's technically lecture 19 total, but it is lecture two on the Purgatorio, day one, shore of Purgatory one, cantos one through four. But before we jump into that, I just want us to look at this schematic of the Purgatorio from lecture one very quickly, just to understand where Dante and Virgil have come from and where they're going to be going over the next 10 cantos. So, Take a look closely here where it says Ushita Dal Inferno, this little um, cavernous hole by the water at the bottom right of this image. That's where Dante and Virgil come out from the Inferno to the Purgatorio. This guy named Cotone here, that's Cato. They run into him. He's the guardian of uh, Purgatory in the same way that Minos is the judge of the damned in the Inferno. We then see a boat coming that is propelled by the wings of an angel, wings that don't even apparently move or, or moved by the, uh, the breeze, sort of like if you have ever read Stephen King's It, he has balloons that go the wrong way for the wind that's pushing them. In any case, they're then going to go over this little path where they're going to find two different types of people. First, the excommunicated people in Canto 3. Those will be the people like Manfred, something to keep in mind. Excommunicated people are like people who are exiled from a certain place. Very much reminds us of people who are exiled to both hell and heaven, the neutral angels, who we also found in Canto 3 of the Inferno. Then in Canto 4, we'll find the first sort of late repentance, people who repent basically at the last moment of their lives or very late in their lives, the negligent ones. We'll meet Balakwa today. He's very lazy. He's like a school-time friend of uh, Dante, and they're going to get into sort of a little small fight. It might remind you a tiny bit of Master Adam and Sinon from very deep in the Inferno, uh, Circle 8, uh, Sub-Circle 10. We'll then, uh, over the next couple days, uh, meet the other sorts of late repentant people, those who died by violent death, ugh, like uh, Boncante, and then also we will get to the Valley of the Rulers at the end. Okay, good. That's how we're starting. In any case, let's talk about some of the themes of the Purgatorio before we get into the facts of the first four cantos themselves. The major theme of Purgatory is rebirth or renewal. And in fact, we have a very famous French word for that, Renaissance. The Renaissance was the renovatio in Latin, the rebirth of culture in the West. And so the idea behind uh, renovation or rebirth here is that one has died, uh, and yet one is reborn as a spirit that must cleanse its soul in order to make it to heaven. It is as if one has thrown off one's mortal coil, one's mortal coil is one's body. The thing that allows one to sin is now gone, and so now the thing that cleanses sin, the soul, can get to the work of washing itself off. It's very similar to the idea of taking a bath at the end of the day. Yeah, just like, say, if you've been riding all day like a cowboy, and you have grime all over you and a rind on you, you got to clean it off? Well, that's the same idea here. It's like one's life is a day, and this is, uh, this is the next morning of one's life when one showers off and gets going. In any case, emerging from the darkness into light is something we see. It is literally... Morning here, uh, Dante comes out of a cavern beneath the world, up into a place where he can see the stars. You see that the metaphors and the similes line up, line up, line up. It is a dawning of consciousness sort of place. It is a place of revelation, a place of realization, and where your sins will be spotlighted and highlighted so that you can get rid of them. Because you have to highlight your errors in order to fix them. Otherwise, they just maintain in the darkness like a fungus. In any case, this is what Ulysses, for all his clever reasoning, failed to do. Recall, he got to the Purgatorio, but just like with the bag of Aeolus uh, and making it to Ithaca the first time, a storm hits him and he doesn't quite make it. This is the realization that he does not quite make. That rather than using his intellect to cleanse sin, he uses his intellect to deceive people. That is, in fact, a big difference between how Dante sees the appropriate use of the intellect and how Dante perceives the improper use of the intellect made by the ancient Greeks. In any case, in any case, this is similar to the attempt at Crea ah, yes. Ulysses is seen in the same way that Nimrod and those who create the Tower of Babel were. They attempted to do something, uh, they attempted to overween, to go beyond their nature with their intellects. They attempted to misuse their intellects, and because of that, they were led to failure. Well, this is, according to Dante, the ultimate use of one's intellect. The best thing you can possibly do with your mind, and what you do by freeing one, yourself from sin with your mind, is you liberate your will. And if your will is free, 
then you are free to do whatever it is you want. And that is the idea behind the purgatorio. It, when you make it to the top, you are no longer bound or enslaved by sin, but free to do the best possible thing. And that is when you are free to go to heaven. Very interesting. It's almost like the idea is that to live as a human without sin, with a liberated will, is like being in a living heaven, rather than being in a living prison-like hell, like the inferno. Very interesting. In any case, we also have the theme of salvation versus damnation. That is the major difference between the inferno and the purgatorio. Those who are saved are those who have been salvated. Uh, and that is where our word salutation and salutatorian comes from. To be uh, salved, or to put salve on, means to save yourself. Well, to be damned, that means to be down in the inferno, without hope, without the good of the intellect, never going anywhere. Well, these people, they are going somewhere. They're all on the way up. And so we have the themes of liberation versus slavery. You liberate your will and instead of enslaving it to uh, sin. Very similar to the idea of fe the Phaedrus, Plato's dialogue, where he says that the soul has three parts. And there's a, it, it's just like a charioteer. And that's the mind. And he has two horses. And one is the spirit. It's a noble horse, beautiful. And one is the appetites. And that's an ugly horse that just tries to pull everything off. Well, the mind has to pull the reins back on that ignoble, appetitive horse so that it is trained like the will, so that the mind, using the will, can do as it wishes rather than being sidetracked by the appetites. And well, that is the place you are supposed to get by the end of the purgatorio. As a soul, you are supposed to be liberated, no longer enslaved. You are also supposed to be liberated from life. Recall, the trappings of life are now hindrances, your friendships, your former loves, your former songs, whether it be Marcia for Cato, whether it be the song of Casella for uh, Dante, or whether it be Dante as friend to Casella. All these things from your mortal life must be given up, even your friendship. Even, even recognizing the beauty of the ocean, the stars, and the fresh grass, all must go. Um, and in any case, these souls must eventually now depart from the estuary, which is uh, the place of growth for children, for small fish is the idea. And then go out into the ocean. Go out into the ocean themselves. The idea here being that your progress is linked to your work and your direction. As an adult, you are responsible for your own decisions. As a soul in purgatory, you are responsible for the cleansing of your own soul. Nobody else. And so this is a canticle of personal responsibility. And we can see that it is uh, very much Dante. Dante is putting his human touch on this. And as you know, this is the canticle that is most unique to the creative mind of Dante. He had the most creative license in making it. And so you should expect it to be the most Dante-like, uh, most severe, most responsible sort of canticle. In any case, I'm just going to read this to you very quickly so that you further understand a few differences between hell and purgatory. I actually took this from a scholar who runs the website digitaldante.com. I definitely recommend that you go there. It has multiple translations, the Longfellow and the Mandelbaum. That's where I get the Mandelbaum translation that I put on these slides. It also has the Italian. It also has audio of the Italian. It also has summaries of every single canto, all hundred of them, and lots of beautiful art, and it's really well done. And so, Digital Dante, highly recommended. In line one, take a look at that. Uh, those lines up there. We see that hell is different from the other two realms and that it is a singular place of damnation. True. Again, the point is that the system is fundamentally binary. That means two. Souls are damned and assigned to hell, or they are saved and assigned first to purgatory and ultimately to paradise. So that means that nobody goes straight to heaven. Everybody who has lived has in some way been corrupted by the body. Like, at the very least, you have some friends, we hope, some memories, some things you like, some stuff that you need to forget and put in the past. And so that's how it works. In line two, and take a look at it, you see eternal, uh, line X, eternal. Purgatory is different. In line two, we see the purgatory is different from the other two realms because it is the only non-eternal realm. It is not eternal because at the last judgment, which we've talked about, which is where the, the, <laughs> the suicides uh, go from just being trees to being trees that had their bodies hanged on them. Ugh, horrifying. Well, uh, it, it is not eternal because at the last judgment, when all souls will be allocated to either hell or paradise, purgatory will cease to exist. And again, this points to the system being fundamentally binary. This is the last one. In line three, 
we see Dante's countervailing narrative strategy for binding hell and purgatory. You say, what does that mean? Both realms are situated in Inferno or on Purgatorio Earth. And they are intimately linked because according to the Dantean mythography of Inferno 34, remember that's a uh, Lucifer falling, Purgatory was created with the Earth, excavated by Lucifer's fall, the fall that created hell. Both realms are conical in shape, both are traversed in spirals, down and to the left in hell, and up and to the right in Purgatory. All right, back to it. All right, so what is Purgatory Revisited? Just final notes on the difference between it and hell so that you know what it is. Between hell and heaven lies the island mountain of Purgatory, literally between them. Because remember, the Inferno is inside the earth. Purgatorio is on a mountain in the southern hemisphere of the earth. Remember that the medievals only knew, oh, well, and we only know about two hemispheres. Hemisphere literally means half sphere, so there can only be two of them. Two halves to a whole, as, there, as it were. And heaven is, of course, in the heavens, in the sky, in the, uh, uh, the cosmos. This is a place of expiation, expurgation, and cleansing of sin. This is like a bathhouse. It's like a bathhouse for souls. In any case, it is a place for sinners who repent to go between life and heaven. And the difference between them is that the sinners in hell, ah, yes, and here is the big, this is the most important thing to focus on in this slide. What then is the biggest difference between sinners who go to hell and sinners who go to purgatory. Well, it's not the severity of the sin. Because, obviously, we'll meet somebody today, Manfred, who was a murderer, and a familial murderer. At the very least, he could be down in Circle 7. And uh, that's a lot worse than, say, Francesca, in a way, who was, say, simply lustful. And yet, she's eternally damned. And this guy is saved. And so, what gives? The big difference between one who has repented and goes to purgatory and one who has not repented and goes to the inferno, is that those who repent consciously recognize that they have erred and accept it and go through the act of contrition. Go through the act of contrition and penance. And so that is the major difference. You've got to recognize that you're making mistakes if you want to make it to the purgatory. You have to recognize that you're making a mistake in order to fix the mistake. If you refuse to recognize that you're making a mistake or an error or committing a sin, well then, are you going to do much to consciously fix that mistake? Absolutely not. If you can't even recognize the fact, you can do very little to change the fact. In any case, Dante, as I've told you, played a leading role in developing this very idea of purgatory, and it is very much an inverted version of hell, not only physically, but uh, trajectorially. Remember, people in hell going down, or at least Dante was going down into the left while he went through hell. Now we're going up into the right. Things are literally looking up, and I'm going to share some images of looking up in just a moment. Here is an image of the earth clock, just to let you know that when we started this journey, going down the inferno, we were in the northern hemisphere. Now we are in the southern hemisphere. We started the journey in the inferno at sunset. We're starting this journey and morning. Things are opposite. It's even the opposite sort of. It's the opposite time of day. It's the opposite hemisphere. You're, we're going the opposite direction, and we're even metaphorically, instead of heading into our own slavery or, or enslaving ourselves further, by going deeper and deeper into the inferno and limiting our motion down at the very bottom, we are getting closer and closer to freedom. So, it looks like things are looking up and we're heading in the right direction. Notice those meaningful metaphors that I shared with you just now. All right. Um, by now, the sun was crossing the horizon of the meridian, whose highest point covers Jerusalem and from the Ganges. We'll just go on. Uh, uh, I'm not going to read this entire thing to you. I'm going to skip this slide. Now the next slide, and even the next slide, and let's get to the angel and saved souls. Beautiful image here, angel leading people, very much like Charon, also very much like the heavenly messenger. Um, uh, one, th one thing, I'm only going to read the last tercet on this slide here. See how he holds his wings, pointing to heaven. So look, there's another metaphor of leading up, looking up, piercing the air with his eternal pinions, that also means wings which do not change as mortal plumage does. All right, so there is something eternal here. Hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good. Looks like I have, oh, yeah, two in a row. Good. All right, in any case, let's look at these symbols. Things are looking up. In the very first cantos, the first canto and the second canto of the Purgatorio, we have several images that direct our eyes upward. It's supposed to show us that hope is in the air again and that there is something to strive towards. Well, let's take a look at them. References to the sky and constellations. We saw the stars themselves. The, 
The, the sky is described as sapphire blue, like a precious, like a precious stone which is then reflected in the water, which is itself beautiful. We have images of constellations, of course, themselves in the sky. Capricorn, which is very famously a goat. Um, uh, <laughs> Cornus means horns. Capris means uh, like goat, so it's like horned goat. And then the scales, that's Libra, of course. And in fact, it is the time of Libra at this precise moment. We might have just moved out of it yesterday, but October is a Libra month. In any case, in large part, the mountain itself, well, a mountain goes high into the air. You look at the top of it, you're looking up. The language itself in the purgatory leads your mind upwards. And <clears throat> something Dante explicitly says is, forgive me if I use more art to describe more celestial things, but the thing is, more elevated language is appropriate to a more elevated topic, and that is something we are going to be running into now. So all these images, ah yes, and of course the angel is described as a bird itself. Where are the birds? They're in the trees, they're in the air, they are above you. So you must look up to them. And that is also one of the reasons why they would have been used as signs for the gods during the Greco-Roman times. Because they're in the air, the gods are in the air, they're obviously sent by the gods, therefore. Alright, all images which draw one's eyes upwards towards the celestial realm, that is the sky. These are metaphors for hope and striving and directing your will appropriately. Good, good. Let's meet Cato of Utica, this Charon slash Minos-like, or sorry, he's more like a Minos-like character here. All right, I saw a solitary patriarch near me, his aspect worthy of such reference that even son to father owes no more. So he's very much like a guide or a judge. He is like a father-like figure. He is old. His beard was long and mixed with white, old, as were the hairs upon his head, and his hair spread down his chest in, in a divided tress. Ah, yes. And a little bit above that, the second tercet here. After my eyes took leave of those four stars, turning a little toward the other pole, from which the wane had disappeared by now. That's another reference to a constellation right there. That's the bears. Um, okay, let's talk about this Cato. We have a couple slides on him. All right. Who is Cato? Cato of Utica. He was a Roman military leader and statesman from 95 to 46 B, C, E. And actually, he's described as having a long grizzled beard, and his face is illuminated by four stars. Let me just make sure I don't have too much more to say here. Okay, so a couple facts about him. He fought in the Roman Civil War on the side of Pompey the Great. Pompey the Great was fighting against Julius Caesar. Obviously, Julius Caesar, since he's the name you know. You only know Pompey because of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. You don't know about Pompey Magnus, even though I mentioned him last year. In any case, Pompeius Magnus is the one who lost that. Supposedly, he was offered safe passage by Cleopatra's brother Ptolemy, and uh, when he got to Egypt, he was stabbed upon stepping off the ship. The messenger who gave Julius Caesar that message supposedly thought that Julius Caesar would be happy, but Julius Caesar um, uh, cast some reproach at him, said, that was a great man, speak no, nothing ill, and burst into tears. Uh, Julius Caesar had tremendous respect for Pompey. And the story goes that Cato, after the defeat of Pompey, not wanting to live in an empire, but rather wanting to be in a democratic republic, committed suicide. And so, a couple questions pop into our heads immediately. A, how is he in purgatory if A, he's a Roman? B, how is he in purgatory if B, he committed suicide? Well, the idea is this. We see four stars in the morning here. That is a metaphor for the four cardinal virtues of the past. The four virtues of the greco Roman world had. In fact, we'll see three sort of star-like things in the evening at the top of the uh, at the top of the Purgatorio, indicating that with the passing of time and the coming of Christian age, three theological virtues will add themselves to the four cardinal virtues, making a full seven. It's as if time has been completed there, because of course uh, seven is the amount of time that a week is. That is the limitation of the span of all human time, because. As you know, we get to the seventh day, and then we do what? Make an eighth day? Nope, we start all over again every single time. In any case, why is Cato in purgatory? Well, the idea seems to be this. Because he fully embodied the four pagan virtues, which are moderation, justice, prudence, and fortitude. Prudence is often called wisdom. Fortitude is often called bravery. Because he so embodied those, he did as much as he possibly could to be civically virtuous. And as a perfectly civically virtuous person, 
he was allowed into purgatory. And you say, but what about the suicide? Well, his reason for suicide was not fear or pain or longing for something that was not. It was, or perhaps it was in some ways, longing for what was not or what was no longer. He committed suicide because he refused to live in an unjust society. And so, because that was his reason for it, he gets a pass for Dante. And recall also that Dante is so pro-Romana, he is so pro-Roman, that he is willing to give the benefit of the doubt to Cato, who was on the losing side of history, but is now on the winning side of the afterlife. And so, also recall, and this will be important in just a moment, that he was married to a woman named Marcia. Um, this is part of the theme of having to put things in the past. Recall it, Virgil mentions to Cato, oh, hey, I know your wife. She's down in limbo with me. We hang out. Do you want me to go tell her something? And Cato says, well, and we might think this is callous. No, I don't want you to tell anything to her because ever since she crossed the Infernal River, that's the river Acheron, well, she, uh, she's dead to me, essentially. And, well, she's dead to him in the same way that his entire life is dead to him and in the same way that all souls in purgatory must, even if it seems cruel, put the past behind them, including the things that they loved in the past, which could very much include a mother, a son, and in this case, a wife. Hmm. Very similar to what poor Aeneas had to do uh, consistently throughout the Aeneid. Remember, he had to lose his wife, had to move on. Had to lose his city, had to move on. Lost his dad, had to move on. Lost his nurse, had to move on. Lost his steersman, had to move on. Even made a new best friend, Book 11. He got killed, had to move on. And so, well, you know, this is a story about... Stewing in it? No, that's the Inferno. It's a story about moving on. Moving on. All right, this is sort of pixelated, granulated image. Don't like it that much. But let's meet Casella. Casella, we meet in Canto 2. I saw one of those spirits moving forward in order to embrace me. His affection so great that I was moved to mime his welcome. Watch this, watch this. You're going to remember three parts. One from the Odyssey, two from the Aeneid when you see this part. Oh, shades, and all except appearance, empty, empty. Three times I clasped my head my hands behind him, and as often brought them back against my chest. Dismay, I think, was painted on my face. At this, that shadow smiled as he withdrew, and I, still seeking him again, advanced. And he, uh, moving to the second turn, said, He answered, As I loved you when I was within my mortal flesh. Notice these, this nostalgia here. As I loved you. I loved you. We were friends. But I'm dead now. We can't be friends anymore. When I was within my mortal f flesh. When I had a body. But I don't have a body now. I've got to move on. So, freed, I love you. Therefore, I stay but you, why do you journey? My own Casella, to return again to where I am, I journey thus. But why, I said, were you deprived of so much time? Okay, three things. The, the three parts of the Aeneid, or the two parts of the Aeneid, the one part of the Odyssey that I was referencing, with the arms trying to clasp, trying to hug, with Dante trying to hug his friend three times. Obviously, you recall the Odyssey, Book 11. Uh, Odysseus, when he sees his mother, and Clary, he tries to hug her three times. It's very sad. She, he can't. She's a shade. It's like she's just a memory because she's in the past and no longer has a body. Well, I remember the Aeneid too. It was very, very sad, very full of pathos when uh, Aeneas sees his wife Creusa at the end of book two, where when Troy has fallen in, but she's all of a sudden bigger and ghastly and scary. She's a ghost. He tries to hug her, but he can't because she's already dead. And then, of course, when he's down in book six in the underworld. He sees his father, tries to hug him three times, can't do it, he's already dead too. Alright, so, who is Casella? He was a Florentine who we don't know almost anything about. We know two things though. We know he was a musician, and we do have one of his pieces of musical composition in the Vatican Library. The Vatican Library is the library, essentially, of the Pope um, in Italy. And it is a tremendous honor to get to go to that library. In fact, if you watch the Da Vinci Code, you can see images of it. I, there are actually books that are so old that they are kept in airlocks so that oxygen does not you know destroy the paper over time very sophisticated technology for a place that's based on very old ideas in any case observe the backsliding in old ways they try and hug each other they rely on their friendship with each other they talk about the past together and in fact dante asks casella and recall what i read to you yesterday and you wrote about in your seminar questions that he asks casella to sing a song for him and he, casella starts to sing he sings about love and uh, Dante is listening, all the other souls are listening, Brad, and then Cato, like a teacher, shows up and says, hey, you guys need to get to work. Can't be just indulging in the past. Well, that experience of indulging in the past, feeling the sweet sorrow of thinking about how good things used to be without all the terrible work you had to do and all the things that caused you suffering, that's called nostalgia. It means actually a pain for home. 
Nostos, homecoming in uh, Greek, and alge, algae, uh, wounds. It's like a, a, a home wound. It's almost like your home leaves a mark on you. And that is the idea. Something leaving a mark on you is something that has either crushed you or wounded you. In any case, uh, an allegorical interpretation of this way of looking at things is that purgatory, like all the canticles, is your memory, and you are not supposed to make an empty playground of your memory and play with ghosts. Your memories are supposed to function as relevant symbols that help you get through your day towards your goals. You're not supposed to just live in your memory. In fact, there is a place in the Aeneid, you probably recall it, book three, where people are trapped in the path, past. They've named this tiny little river that no longer even flows, Xanthos. They call uh, their two citadels Pergamum and uh, uh, Ilion, I think. What The second one's called Ilion. And they're led by a traitorous former uh, Trojan called Helenus. The memory is no place to live. In fact, nobody's alive there. So I highly recommend against it. So does Dante here. Um, I don't really care about talking about this slide, but you can take a look at it when I send it to you. Something just to keep in mind about the first two cantos is you'll see people being pretty bewildered. Very bewildered, just like the first two cantos of the Inferno when Dante was in bewildered in a dark forest, not knowing where to go. Well, all the souls, when they get off the boat, they actually look to Virgil. They're like, where do we go? And Virgil's like, uh, I don't know. I just came out of hell. I'm not a guide here. And they all have to sort of look for themselves. Well, the idea behind that is, who is your guide in purgatory? You are. You are yourself. And that is just, I love teaching this to sophomores, that is the idea we are preparing you for. You all kind of look at me, and sometimes you're a little bored. You're like, Mr. Man, why are you saying all this stuff to me? It's like, enjoy it while you still have a guide. Because in two years, I'm going to send you out in the world. And all of a sudden, you're going to realize just how complex things are. It's going to be really hard. Like I've told you before, I have six types of insurance that I manage always. Car insurance, home insurance, uh, dental insurance, accidental death insurance, accidental dismemberment insurance. Uh, even more insurance than that, too. Uh, dental insurance as well. It's like, yeah, yeah, I know. Can I get dismembered while teaching? Maybe. Who knows? Who knows? I don't know. Uh, I do have swords in here. <laughs> in any case... In any case, let's meet Manfred and the Excommunicated. All right, do I want to read any of this? No, you know, I read this to you yesterday, and this is part of what you're looking at for your seminar. But so I'll start on the last tercet of the first quoted line, or the first quoted slide. Then, as he smiled, he told me, I am Manfred, the grandson of Empress Constance. Thus I pray that when you reach the world again, you may go to my lovely daughter, mother of the kings of Sicily and Aragon, tell her the truth, lest she's heard something other. After my body had been shattered by two fatal blows, those are the blows you see on this image of him here, right above his brow and right above his chest there. It's like, it's like he's actually got his Halloween costume on. Maybe one of you will go as Manfred to, uh, you know, that'd be very funny. I'll, I'll definitely give you extra credit. And it, this is being recorded, so it's fine. If you dress as somebody from the Inferno or as uh, <laughs> from the Purgatory, maybe you can go with your cronies as the Malabronque and be uh, saluting in the way that Malacoda did. Anybody get what that means? No, just kidding. In any case, my sins were, oh, after my body had been shattered by two fatal blows in tears, I then consigned myself to him who willingly forgives. My sins were ghastly, but the infinite goodness, God, has arms so wide that it accepts whoever would return imploring it. Notice that it there is capitalized, that is a convention of, uh, that is a convention to even when you refer to God in English by pronoun, if it is the Christian God, to capitalize it. Sometimes that's honored, sometimes it's not. It sort of depends on whether somebody uh, is faithful or not. So, something to keep in mind if you're ever writing like that. In any case, he does say something that we need to see. Third tercet on the next slide. Along this shore, for 30 times the span he spent in his presumptuousness, unless that edict is a bridge through fitting prayers. All right, we just learned two very important things. All right, so I'll read the tercet right above. But it is true that anyone who dies in contumacy, that means against the will of the Holy Church, though he repented at the end, must wait along this shore for 30 times the span he spent in his presumptuousness. All right, those, though, beyond, advance more quickly. Okay, I'll tell you some facts about Manfred and what it was he was just saying to us, and then we're going to be almost done for today. So, Manfred is an excommunicated person who died with the word Mary on his lips. He was actually excommunicated, you'll notice if you look at the bottom of the slide, twice. Once by Pope Alexander IV in 1258, he got let back into the fold. That apparently can happen. Uh, he had his sins forgiven, like Boniface said he would do for Guido de Montefeltro, but that didn't work out, obviously. He then got re-excommunicated by Pope Urban IV in 1261. Okay, okay, why was he excommunicated so many times? Well, perhaps this will add to your, your image of him. 
He was alleged by some to have murdered his father. That's Frederick II, uh, who's down in the river of boiling blood, Phlegathon, in Canto 12 of the Inferno. Um, his half-brother, his two nephews, and he even tried to assassinate his nephew, Conrad. Wow. And all he had to do to make it into heaven was have Mary on his lips. Actually, you know, I don't think it was actually Mary that he had on his lips. I think that might be a small error, because he doesn't say he had Mary. No, no, no. It is actually Von Conte who had Mary on his lips. So, in any case, he died repenting at the end, but he wasn't the one that was saying Mary. So, know that that is a small mistake, and I'm going to erase that from the slide, so if you're listening to this later, you won't even see it. In any case, remember also, he is very much the person that was killed by Frater Albergo. Remember, Frater Albergo was down in Circle 9 of the Inferno. He's the one who said, bring on the fruit! And then they brought on the swords, and they killed Manfred for some slight that he had committed against the Frater, that the Frater said he had given up, or had forgiven Manfred from, from but obviously he had not, because he still killed him over it. All right, good. What we just learned, something very important, and it says it at the bottom here, six. Prayer. Apparently, when somebody alive prays for you, and he asks for Dante to tell his daughter about him, when you are prayed for, that speeds you along purgatory. Apparently, the love of somebody that they consciously choose to act on and think well of you with can push you up the purgatorio faster. In fact, we're going to find one guy who actually gets almost to the top of the purgatorio because his former wife cries so much for him that she's apparently gotten him almost to the top of the purgatorio in five years. We'll, but we'll meet people like Statius who have been on the purgatorio in just two terraces for at least something like 900 years. So, prayers equal good for you in the purgatory. Also, I don't, I don't have it written here, but I should. Remember the equation that he just gave us, and I'll just turn it back to it very quickly. If you are excommunicated, you must wait 30 times the amount of time you were excommunicated while alive before exiting the shore of purgatory and entering the seven terraces. In your book, they're called the seven cornices of purgatory. I'll sometimes call them just levels. They're all the same thing, though. So, if he, say, were, were dead three years after being excommunicated for the second time, then he would have to wait 30 times three years, 90 years to get his journey started. My goodness. All right, in any case, let's move on from the excommunicated, communicated to Balakla and the late repentant, the first sort of late repentant, the negligent. Yes? Um, who did um, Manfred allegedly tell it? Manfred allegedly killed several people. His father, Frederick II, his half-brother, his two nephews, and he tried to assassinate his nephew, Conrad. All right, good. All right, Balakwa. I really want to read this to you, but I just don't know how much time I will. So Dante, in this first slide, is basically talking about, he hears that the mountain is hard at first, but easier as it goes. It's sort of like when you're building a habit. At first, when you first do something, you try and dance, try and play a musical instrument, exercise for the first time, get... You're really bad at it. You don't like it. You're sore afterwards. It's embarrassing. Of course. Well, that's how every journey is at the beginning. Well, as you do something, you get better at it. It becomes easier to do. You take more pleasure in doing it. Even going up the purgatorio is like that. And so, eventually, uh, Dante, he makes this claim that he's like, oh, uh, yeah, well, you know, I, I'd like to make it up to the top. And he hears from his crony, his former school time friend, perhaps you will need to, you will have to need to sit before you reach that point. And so they have a very, very, very amusing, and if you have the time, I recommend that you reread this interaction between each other. Do I have this repeated again? My goodness. Too many repetitions in this one. Oh, my sweet Lord, Dante says when he sees his friend all crouched over and looking, uh, and looking uh, bent over, he says, oh, man, are you still doing the same things that you've always been doing, Balacqua? And you can imagine, like, catching your friend doing something and being sort of lazy, and you're like, what are you doing? You doing nothing? What are you doing over here? And that is essentially how the interaction goes. In any case, this guy moves slowly. He's obviously a symbol for negligence. He even says, oh brother, what's the use of climbing? God's angel, who he who guards the gate, would not let me pass through to meet my punishment. Unless he gets helped by prayer, again, to move faster. And <laughs> Do I have it said here? Okay, in any case. Uh, this is our last slide of the day. Dante and Virgil have begun the ascent. And Dante, as it said in the previous four cantos, or excuse me, the previous four slides, not cantos, of course, is tired at the beginning. 
And uh, I have a quote here. I used to say it was a fortune cookie quote. I think it actually did literally come from a fortune cookie that I had, which is, laziness is resting before being tired. I think that's an excellent definition of laziness. Resting before you are tired. That's pretty good. Well, Balacqua was a friend of Dante's, who was known by story to be so lazy that he entered a shop at the beginning of the day and did not get up all day except to eat and to sleep. So he's lazy. He doesn't move around. He likes to sit around. He's indolent. And so, these late repentant, these souls must now wait in anti-purgatory for as long as they negligently delayed their repentance on earth. That is the length of their mortal life. So know the difference between those who are late repentant, negligent, who must wait the entirety of the time they waited to repent, and those who are excommunicated, who have to wait 30 times the time they were excommunicated while alive. All right, good work.